So the opinions here, we always say that no matter if we or if not, uh, the opinions expressed by contributors are not necessarily those of CSJ. They might be, but not necessarily so. And it might be of some of us and it might be of other people. So um, that's basically how the cookie crumbles. Uh, so welcome to the Let's Connect series of interactive meetings. Uh, we are having that every month and uh, except for in December, we are not having it. So this meeting, today's meeting, will um, feature Dying with Dignity Canada's Chris Jones who's speaking to us. And our next CSJ meeting will be on Saturday, November 25 at one o'clock Eastern time. And Reverend Baltians Nadagi Jimana will speak about his experiences as humanitarian minister coming from Africa to Canada. He founded the Burundian Unitarian Universalist Church and was vice president of the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists, which unfortunately ceased to exist uh, last year. Uh, now, if you have any suggestion for a great uh, subject or speaker, please let us know at cusjmedia at gmail.com. cusjmedia at gmail.com. Or to president at cusj.org. So, uh, and if you want to be uh, uh, part of uh, our team of uh, CSJ board, we can use certainly some more people uh, and uh, we have a great team, uh, but uh, we can always use some more uh, people to to uh, to help out. And uh, the co-hosts of today are also members of our CSJ board. Here we have uh, Dying with Dignity and Chris Jones uh, in the series uh, Let's Connect You Use Social Justice. Our speaker today is Chris Jones. Uh, and he is the Director of Government and Stakeholder Relations of Dying the Dignity of Canada. He will provide a detailed analysis of the major changes to the criminal code that uh, uh, Dying with Dignity Canada is seeking and the broader political backdrop against uh, which that is happening. And their website is dyingwithdignity.ca. It cannot be simpler. Uh, so there will be uh, time for questions after the presentation. So I would say, uh, take it away, Chris. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I do have a, a PowerPoint here um, for you all, which may make things a little bit easier in terms of following uh, what I'm saying. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So can you all see that? Yeah, okay. I can see it, but you're still in uh, in edit mode or whatever. So oh, okay. Yeah, just go to slideshow. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, no problem. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Anyways, um, so, well, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, Thank you, Ellen and Jim, for reaching out. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about a topic today that I, I know is somewhat controversial for some people, um, but I will try to present the issues as objectively and non-emotively as I can. Um, so uh, so I, let me just begin perhaps with a, um, a our own land acknowledgement. So um, I'll just see if I can remove some of those. Okay, well, um, Dying with Dignity Canada, which off national office, which is based in Toronto, um, is on the traditional home of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Our presence on this land is not to be taken for granted. We are grateful for the opportunity to share, meet, collaborate, live and work on this land and additionally we believe it's our responsibility as both an organization and as individuals to learn about the current and historical effects of settler colonialism in Canada. 
Oops. Page down here. Hmm. I'm just having trouble advancing my screen here. Oh, there we go. I need to hit it. So, um, actually, I'd like to try and remove that. There we go. Um, so, I have an agenda for today's uh, session. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own organization, then discuss an issue that's in the news, advanced requests, talk also about made for mental disorders, and then an issue that we're encountering at the provincial level, which is institutional religious obstruction, um, or in its shorthand, sometimes known loosely as forced transfers. So about my own organization, it was founded in 1980 by a registered nurse named Marilyn Sagan. It was, so it's been around over 40 years now. It was incorporated as a registered Canadian charity in 1982. It has a staff of 15 based in Toronto, although I am in Ottawa. I'm one of the currently two employees based up here because my work mostly involves dealing with the federal government who oversees the criminal code. So we do a lot of government affairs and advocacy work here in Ottawa, although we do do work as well in the provincial capitals. Um, it's overseen by a board of 13 people. We have two advisory councils made up of physicians or clinicians, the Clinicians Advisory Council and the Made for Mental Disorders Advisory Council. And we are funded exclusively by private donations from individual supporters, donations, bequests, and contributions in kind. We have no government funding and we receive no corporate funding either. So our mission is, as you can see, to ensure access to quality end of life choice and care through three things, advocacy, which I do, education and support. And I would argue that our latter vocation of support is probably the most important one. We have a team of three individuals who provide advice to folks and family members seeking made from every aspect of it. Um, to the initial application process, to to witnessing, to various other um, psychosocial kind of needs. We don't provide explicit counseling and we don't certainly do assessments. That's reserved exclusively for clinicians, but we kind of provide some general background support. Um, so I thought I'd run through a little bit um, the brief kind of potted history of the jurisprudence and the legislation, just a couple of slides, excuse the density of them. So uh, as a quick reminder, in 1993, the Supreme Court um, dismissed the appeal by Sue Rodriguez, who had been challenging the prohibition on assisted suicide. That was a close run thing. I think it was like a five to four vote. Um, in 2012, the BC Supreme Court rules that the right to die with dignity is protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but that is also appealed by the feds. Um, in 2015, we have the first, the beginnings of the ultimate uh, ruling that brought us, that brought us made, and that was Gloria Taylor and Kay Carter arguing that their Section 7 rights to liberty and security of the person were in, being infringed. The Supreme Court agreed and declared that section 241 of the criminal code was henceforth invalid. That's the one that criminalizes the taking of life by a, a physician. Um, in 2016, uh, the government responds with its first piece of legislation, C-14. It receives royal assent and it allows MAID, medical assistance in dying with strict eligibility criteria, safeguards and a 10 day waiting period. A little later on in 2019, we have, uh, and by the way, in that first instance of, of C-14, death had to be reasonably foreseeable. Um, in this case, in 2019, and tw uh, two individuals in Quebec, Jean Truchon and Nicole Gladu, challenge the argument, uh, the insistence on a reasonably foreseeable death requirement in C-14, arguing that they were suffering grievously nonetheless, and the Quebec Superior Court agrees with them in finding that the, the reasonably foreseeable natural death requirement violates their charter rights. 
So the government, of course, responds because it has to at that point. It doesn't incidentally uh, refer the matter to the Supreme Court. It uh, takes it as read that it would lose any such reference and legislates um, a C7 in 2021, which removes the requirement for a reasonably foreseeable death and also introduces the waiver of final consent, sometimes known as Audrey's Amendment. Uh, so it makes those changes to the criminal code and henceforth RFND is now also possible, uh, non-RFND to be honest. Um, then the, the next kind of significant piece of legislation I would say would be uh, this year, C-39. The original bill, C-7, had included a sunset clause which temporarily um, suspended the coming into force of made for a mental disorder. And so that was um, about to expire in March of 2023. There was a lot of controversy about that. The government quickly adopted some legislation. It passed at breakneck speed and it delayed the exclusion of MDSUMC. That stands for, by the way, mental disorder as a sole underlying medical condition until March of 2024. So that received royal assent. And hence, we are now uh, four, five, five, six months away from, from having MDSUMC uh, in the spring. So, but I want to turn my, so that's kind of a brief history. I want to turn my attention now to three substantive issues. The first is an advance request, which some of you may have heard about. And I've got a definition here from the Canadian Bar Association. So it is effectively a request for made by a capable person, namely the applicant, who has been diagnosed with a grievous and irremediable medical condition where the request is triggered in the event of the applicant's, applicant's subsequent incapacity and on the occurrence of specified future circumstances detailed in a written document. These are known as triggering conditions. So that is effectively what that is. So I just, here's a little uh, slide which kind of shows the difference between an advanced request and something that was brought in uh, a couple of years ago, the waiver of final consent. The waiver of final consent is where you um, have been uh, assessed for MAID, you've been approved, um, a date has been set and everything is, is about to happen. And then, um, and your death has to be, in that case, reasonably foreseeable. It's not yet for those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. And um, the, the disease prognosis would indicate a likely loss of competence in the interim. So in that event, the patient and the clinician may sign a waiver the final consent to allow MAID to proceed on or slightly before that specified date uh, as a function of your clinical state at the time. Clearly, you're going to be irreversible. There is no chance of a recovery. And you've um, already indicated a clear desire for MAID. And, and I just want to specify, of course, that you would all know that MAID is a completely voluntary uh, activity. It must be, uh, there must be no evidence of coercion of any kind. The individual must freely consent to it uh, from the beginning to the end, and normally with repeated instances of such request uh, over a period of time. So um, now an advanced request by contrast is something slightly different. It's when you, as I indicated, when you would specify upon a diagnosis of a qualifying condition that you anticipate given the like, likely trajectory of that illness, that um, once there's a set of triggering conditions that exist, um, and these are quite often with neurocognitive disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, and so on, various other dementias, that when you when those conditions are met, that you would like that clinician to honor your wishes and administer MAID. Now that can be made several years in advance and without, at this point, unlike a waiver of final request, without a, a date given, but you would still have to meet the objective criteria for MAID. Uh, eventually you would be assessed, but if you lose consciousness, cannot give what's called 
contemporaneous consent, which is normally what's required, um, you would then, in theory, uh, uh, upon a um, somebody who's you've designated as a sort of um, kind of supplementary decision maker or somebody who's who's going to alert the clinician that you've reached a stage where those conditions you specified have obtained and you are suffering grievously, they will alert the clinician who will then have an onus or an obligation to verify that that is indeed true. Then at that possibility, at that time, it's possible that MAID would be administered uh, you know, at your at your request. Now, the, we'll get into some of the technicalities of that, but but that's the gist of it. Oops, uh, having trouble moving forward here. Let's see if that page down. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, there we go. Um, so. Uh, again, in summary, uh, an advance request is a written declaration that may be may be administered if the individual has lost capacity to consent, if there are enduring conditions, loss of autonomy is a typical one that many people cite that they believe is, is too much for them to bear, intolerable suffering related to their serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability, and they are clearly identified in the declaration. They would have been ascertained by a MAID agent, uh, that was the term I was looking for, and can be observed by the uh, physician or nurse practitioner. So we are talking here about um, a, a situation in which you have a diagnosis. In other words, post-diagnosis. You've got a, a condition, clinical condition, it's well known, it will likely have certain um, outcomes, in the over time and so that is kind of the ideal starting point for an advance request now there is a another argument that some would make that you shouldn't necessarily need to have a diagnosis that let's say you've got a family history of high blood pressure and strokes and that you yourself suffer from that and that there's a you know maybe a, some of your family have have sustained strokes and suffered grievously, you may be concerned that that uh, fate may befall you, and therefore you would want to be able to specify in the event that happens to me, even though I'm not, I presently don't have a stroke, that you would honor that situation should it occur. Um, and for somebody who's who's got that kind of a family history, that may be a compelling argument. However, we're more convinced that in the short term, the legislators are, are only likely to allow advance requests with a diagnosis for the moment. Although we hope that to, if it goes through eventually, um, to be able to change that view um, and expand the definition. Um, but basically it does require consent be obtained, draft triggering conditions um, would be easier to be outlined and specified and detailed, given that you would know your prognosis. And it's also consistent with a couple of things. A Quebec's recent Bill 11, which makes provision for advanced requests. Um, and it says in the case of a, a, a diagnosis that is known, um, the Senate public bill S248, which is not yet public, uh, which is not yet law, um, also calls for advanced requests with a diagnosis. And then finally, the recent committee of the recent report of the Joint House Senate Committee on Medical Assistance in Dying uh, also called for with a diagnosis. So our view on advanced requests is that they respect the fundamental charter principle of security of the person and the sanctity of personal autonomy. And this is what the Canadian Bar Association also believes. So um, the, the challenge in not having an advanced request regime in this country, which we presently don't, is that individuals with capacity impairing conditions effectively are forced into two situations. For the first one is that uh, it's known as loosely known as missing the window. It's basically fear of losing capacity. In other words, that ability to give contemporaneous consent leads them to want to take made earlier. 
So they end up opting for it earlier than they would because they want to be secure in the knowledge that they can give consent to the clinician. The other is that if you miss the window, um, as many people do because they don't know about it, maybe their doctor doesn't tell them, then they, they, they slip into a state where they can't give consent and cognition is no longer there and they end up suffering in a, in a very uh, detrimental way for, in some cases, a long period of time. And many of us know individuals in my own family. I had an uncle who went through this and it's a slow, um, very slow degenerative process. So the result of not having this um, uh, legal provision is anxiety, stress, and fear of missing the window. The other thing that people do sometimes to ensure that they can give consent is they forego pain management. Because if you are heavily sedated, you quite often are, your thinking is not clear, you can't give consent. So this forces people who want to retain that clearness of mind to forego pain management. Well, that is equated to suffering, right? And then also it clearly results in premature requests for MAID. So our belief is that allowing a wider patient population to access MAID would thereby avoid the hastening of a MAID provision and on the other side, long-term or you know, intense suffering. Um, so they, our view is that in a philosophical sense, an advanced request for MAID maximizes autonomy and self-determination by enabling individuals to affect decisions about their end of life plans in the event of a capacity loss. And so this particular view is endorsed by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. They do support the right of folks living with dementia to have autonomy over decisions affecting their health. And that includes an advanced request. They think it is necessary. And a number of the folks who testified uh, over the last year at the AMAD committee in Ottawa were individuals uh, diagnosed with these conditions or had seen a loved one recently uh, deteriorate. And they also made the case that they feel that this ability to make an informed decision and to retain autonomy is critical to them. And, and they believe it's uh, something that um, a, a, a compassionate and humane society would want to have. Now, at the moment, there's no, with one exception, Quebec, there's no jurisdiction in the country or federally that allows them. But Quebec has broken the pattern. And as of June of this year, it has amended its own end of life care act to allow specifically for advanced requests. So that was voted on 103 um, members of the assembly in Quebec out of 125 voted for it. So there is a substantial consensus in Quebec about the desirability of that. So the Bill 11, as it was known, has a number of what we believe are safety features that are worth replicating nationwide. So the patient um, assisted by a physician or a specialized nurse practitioner would detail what physical or psychological conditions constitute intolerable suffering. It also includes additional safeguards. Um, there must it must be medically recognized as a result of the person's of the patient's particular illness, and it also must be objectively observable. Um, there is a an oversight body, the Commission on End of Life Care, and it, it ensures that the the providers will comply with the provisions of the bill, and it's composed of eleven health and social service professionals, including doctors, nurses, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, legal experts, lawyers and notaries, users of institutions, um, ethic, folks involved in ethics, bioethics, and the institutions themselves. Um, and then finally, the important thing to remember is that we, there would always be uh, a strong commitment to, to honoring the demonstration of refusal. So that if the patient voluntarily demonstrates through words sounds or gestures at the time of made provision that he or she doesn't want this procedure, then the made becomes invalid. Now there is something known as involuntary demonstration, which the law already uh, accounts for, and that does not invalidate AR. Now that's a very clinical matter and I wouldn't be able to comment on it, but it's 
It's understood to be situations where they're kind of reflexive movements that could be construed as a refusal, but but my, but are actually not. And that is in accordance with current federal laws. Um, okay, so um, here are the other safety features that I we think that the federal government contemplating this initiative should keep in mind. Um, it should be, the information should be provided to the patient in a clear and accessible manner. When drafting the advanced request, the patient is to be assisted by a competent professional that might be a notary or a lawyer. Um, the professional obligation to inform uh, in a patient about withdrawal, modification processes, triggering conditions, results in a made assessment by two competent professionals. So it's not just one doctor, it has to be two. Um, a trusted third person may be designated as well as alternates, and that person would look after the wealth being and welfare of the individual, the applicant, um, and they would be legally um, kind of seen as such within the system of decision-making um, once the patient loses capacity. Uh, and they, they're the ones responsible for notifying the care team that the triggering conditions appear to have been met. And um, Quebec also keeps a provincial directory of, of all advanced directives, which now includes advanced requests for MAID. So um, for an AR to be valid, it must be registered in the provincial directory. So we're, we wouldn't be alone in pursuing this if we did it. It does exist in other countries and strictly monitored and controlled. The Netherlands has one called an advanced euthanasia directive, minimum age 16, um, a standard form with a, with a personal statement, and the individual, the doctor and the patient have to reach the conclusion that the patient's suffering is hopeless and unbearable, and it's overseen by regional committees. Belgium has a similar uh, provision. It must be drafted or affirmed within five years for it to be valid. There's no minimum age. Any legally competent person or emancipated minor, which we have not got to here, and uh, uh, so we needn't worry about that here. And there is some oversight done by federal control and evaluation. Likewise, in Luxembourg, there is a similar system, minimum age of 18, and they seek a renewal and confirmation of those requests every five years. And finally, in Spain, um, it's the exception to the normal contemporaneous consent requirement, but it's for people who lack capacity, suffer a serious and incurable illness or chronic and impossible condition. They have a legal directive signed pri previously prior to their capacity loss, and it applies to folks who are 16 uh, at minimum. So um, in terms of additional safeguards, we believe that there should be uh, an individual's preference has to remain stable over time. This can't be a very recent thing. It has to have been expressed repeatedly, consistently, that um, and that will help somebody to feel if, it's, if, the, if the five year renewal is the maximum period, then the provider will feel a little more confident carrying out an advanced request. It will change things a bit because the provincial laws, if it's one thing for the feds to decriminalize it, there would have to be some corresponding changes in provincial rules around consent, which govern what clinicians can do in certain situations. So it's not just a matter of the feds changing the law. There would have to be some corresponding changes provincially. It's currently a provision in the Senate bill I mentioned earlier, Bill S248. And the, the requirement for a five-year validity period is in existence in Belgium and, and Luxembourg. Some people would argue that you don't need a validity limit um, because partially the cost, you have to keep renewing it. Um, there is a risk that somebody would lapse. Um, it would lapse due to patient's forgetfulness or lack of access to resources. So they might not update it, but they might still want an AR. So there, there may be some issues there, unintended barriers to access. But in the end, we kind of believe that a five-year validity limit should be implemented 
um, if the government take or some designated government agency takes on the responsibility of reaching out and ensuring that those requests have been affirmed or updated. Um, so in terms of, uh, we'd also be looking for interprovincial compatibility. So if this were to happen, let's say I make one in Saskatchewan, but I move to Nova Scotia, I would want the one I made in Saskatchewan to be eligible and recognized in Nova Scotia. So we need to have some kind of a set of minimum acceptability standards. Um, and and it, having that kind of interprovincial recognition or some federal oversight would allow us to keep track of trends and data and so on. And I think that's important. Um, Quebec, as it, we mentioned, does have a provincial level registry that will include advanced requests. It currently includes DNR orders for, for surgeries and so on. And um, the, in the Netherlands, they have a database hosted by the Ministry of Health that publishes an annual report. So these are some of the kinds of safeguards that we think would have to be built in. Um, in terms of polling, and I haven't leaned on that too much in this uh, presentation, but we survey regularly with Ipsos, our partner, uh, in fairly thorough ways. It's a large sample with a lot of data. I'm not suggesting that other polling uh, instruments that you may have seen of late um, aren't equally rigorous and valid, but we ask the same questions repeatedly and we couch it in fairly clear specific language. And what it shows is universally a very high level of popularity um, across Canada, across regions, across age groups and income categories, across religious affiliation. Um, I, there's just an understanding that there's a lot of needless suffering. And some people feel that a lot of people feel that this is a sensible precaution to take or a measure to take, providing safeguards and precautions are in place. Um, so that's kind of, um, we believe they're an autonomy bolstering tool that can enhance one's life in terms of the, the end of one's life with dignity. Now I wanna move on to the second topic um, and then we can come back to questions. And this is a little bit more of a contentious one. It's been in the news a lot of late. And this is um, made for mental disorders as the sole underlying medical condition, SUMC. It's a track two condition, which means that death is not reasonably foreseeable. So in track one is when death is foreseeable. You've got metastatic cancer, for instance. But in this case, your death is not imminent, but you are suffering nonetheless. And so what happened with this was the in, in the C7 bill, which was was meant which came into force in 2021 the government introduced a sunset clause for two years postponing its um coming into force until march of 23 again there was a controversy and that was postponed a further year until march of 2024 now we believe that it affirms the charter rights of canadians it is aimed at avoiding the stigma and differential treatment of individuals based on their illness type at the moment, it's it's a little bit like we're saying physical illnesses are worthy and merit this kind of relief from suffering, but a lifelong struggle with a serious uh, mental disorder doesn't. And you know, the, the suffering we believe is no different in many respects. So that's one of the arguments. But but I think what we see really is the safeguards that are built in here. So the anticipated profile is someone who has a long-standing mental disorder, who's received a substantial amount of therapeutic interventions for a prolonged period of time, but still continues to suffer intolerably and unremittingly. So it's that it's a fairly unique case. It's not a the garden variety of depression and anxiety that somebody might present with uh, earlier in their life. This is a you know, these are often chronic conditions. We haven't had any, of course, yet, um, but they would be very different from some of what has been bandied about in the news. Um, an applicant must make a voluntary request to a physician or nurse practitioner asking to be assessed. So once again, completely voluntary. 
uh, for uh, just to be assessed. So this language that's been used in a number of polls recently that individuals are being offered made is such a travesty. Nobody is offered made. You have to request it and then you have to be assessed and it has to be a voluntary request. So you don't walk into a hospital and be told, would you like to have made today? That's not how it works. Two physicians or nurse practitioners must independently assess you. They must be trained in made assessment and they must perform due diligence on a case by case basis. So it has, it's a very thorough process. It, um, it would typically require, it, it doesn't mandate a, right away, but usually the first doctor or clinician would likely be the patient's own family physician. But it would, if it, you're going, if you're presenting for a, a mental disorder, it's very likely that the second independent psychiatrist, second independent physician, would be a psychiatrist or somebody who is an expert in your condition. And the other uh, safeguard is that 90 days must pass between the assessment and the provision. And during that time, the patient must be informed of alternative treatments and offered consultations with relevant professionals. And, and quite often, 90 days would be uh, the minimum. And in fact, some of our folks who are clinicians who are involved in this work in terms of getting ready for it say that in practice, it would typically be six months to a year just in practice because of the need to verify things where we're not, nothing like this is undertaken because it's so final would be undertaken in a kind of trivial manner. Another important uh, safeguard is if you come in with suicidal ideation or you are presently in an acute crisis, no provision of MAID occurs. So this has to be a deliberate, repeated, constant request made over a lengthy period of time for someone who has a long-standing mental disorder that has caused that person immense suffering over a, you know many decades. So if you come in, as again, some media have misleadingly alleged because you're having, you're feeling down and you're, you're 25 and things aren't going well, you've maybe had a broken relationship, you are not going to be getting made in the hospital that day. That is not a possibility. So that there needs to be a little bit, I'm sorry if I sound a little bit outspoken about that, but there's been a lot of myths that have been, and misinformation that have been put out there in the last six months about this. And we do, do need to debunk some of it. So um, what else was done by way of safeguards? There was an expert panel on maid and mental illness that reported in 2022. It made 19 recommendations re regarding requests for medical assistance dying for somebody who has a mental illness. The federal government and the provinces have recently put together Health Canada, a model practice standard and an accompanying document known as Advice to the Profession, it was published in March of this year. It's the first time in our history that the federal government has led a collaborative and comprehensive approach to clinical standard setting in this country. So because they're aware of how controversial it was, they convened a committee, they uh, got experts together, they said, what would be, how would you approach irremediability? How would you approach diagnosis? And then they, they put together something which they then shared with the provinces. Normally the provinces uh, devise this, this advice to their own clinicians by themselves. The feds have done that. So, And then on top of that, we have an organization called the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers, KMAP, or CAMAP, and it's also just completed a made curriculum, which includes a module specific to a mental, made for mental disorders. So all of that to say that we anticipate a very small number of individuals would be eligible under this criteria. It's not, you know, this is what our clinicians are saying. It's there are people who have just suffered for a lifetime or a lengthy period of time. And that is the, the, the target group, if you like, or the group that would be eligible. You know, there's no target group, the group that would be coming forth with a request. Um, and it, and these other notions that made is somehow seen to be an economy measure or you know a budget saving measure are just, they, are, they should hardly be dignified with a response. They're so outrageous. Some of the things that are being said in the media at the moment. Um, I wanted to move now to the last topic and then take your questions. Um, <clears throat> and this is an issue that we're encountering 
at the provincial level, um, and that's the issue of institutional religious obstruction, or what we loosely call forced transfers. And this is where people's lawful access to MAID is being impeded or obstructed by faith-based institutions, hospitals, hospices, long-term care facilities, who object to MAID. Um, it, it's also, to a lesser extent, also encountered in certain secular facilities based on particular palliative care philosophies. Not by no means everyone, but just in some, where some people view palliative care and MAID as completely uh, opposite ends of the spectrum and um, that, that you cannot have MAID in that setting. There are some doctors that have that view. So it's not restricted just to religious denominational institutions. It, it has taken place in some secular ones. These are often top-down decisions. They're not universally shared by all the staff. And the, cons the, the restrictions consist of refusing to allow the staff or outside health professionals to give information, assess eligibility, or provide MAID. And this results in what's known as a forced transfer, where because if the person follows through on their desire to have MAID, they, are, they insist on it, then the hospital then or hospice will transfer you to another institution, a non-objecting institution. But that often happens at the 11th hour, and it's not a very pleasant experience. Now, there's been some research about this by Canadians, but funded by an Australian grant. The Australian Centre for Health Law Research funded an uh, extensive amount of research in the last year. And what it found was that this policy of religious objection or obstruction, it harms patients and families through stigmatization, less choice about where to die, additional advocacy, paperwork, and logistics that the family or the applicant then has to engage in, disrupted therapeutic relationships, because when a patient indicates a desire for MAID, uh, if the doctor or the, you know, the, the folks on the ward or the management of the hospital disagree, then that previous patient relationship, which may have resulted in a you know, very good level of care, is disrupted. Um, and then there is the suffering brought on by forced transfers themselves, which often occur under heavy sedation. Um, and there can be problems with that if you, somebody has is in the final stages of, of cancer and maybe their any kind of movement is also incredibly painful. And also it, it kind of disrupts the notion that if you're in a long-term care home or maybe even a hospice where you've been for a while, you come to regard that as your home. And suddenly you're being told that your home isn't your home. And because you're requesting what is a lawful procedure and recognized as such, you must nonetheless leave this place and go to another place. The research also shows that it harms health professionals. So the first is those who might not agree with their institution's policy have a sense of failing the patient. They have some distress from witnessing the forced transfer against conscience because they feel it goes against their own conscience. It, it may create tensions with other healthcare professionals. And finally, it can cause conflict between that healthcare worker and the institutional position, you know, the, the hospital's views. Finally, it also may add workload pressures because individuals are forced to find alternative locations that would accept the patient who was seeking MAID. Quite often this is done right at the very end. Uh, death is imminent. Uh, there's significant pain at that point and the person just wants relief. Instead, um, some folks are tasked with finding another location and that's, that adds stress to everybody's life. So what do we think needs to happen? We think that we need to start putting patients first. Institutions should educate themselves on the harms to patients and adopt a patient-centered approach to avoid them. We also believe there needs to be support to certain health professionals who, within objecting institutions. Those who do not support the official policy, they go through a great deal of stress. They're forced to suppress their views and they that may aggravate their conscience give them a sense of guilt, so some kind of help there. We think there should be stronger regulation. 
and patients may have limited geographical treatment options. So in some places, a denominational hospital that bans may, may be the only option for that patient. And so if right away that's not going to be possible in that place, then that is really constraining the rights of a Canadian to um, to kind of pursue the medical treatment they wish. And um, I think when we get down to it, there is a clash between an institution's desire or wish not to provide these services with the existential suffering that somebody is enduring at the end of their life. And to decide in the favor of the former rather than the latter seems not right to many of us. And finally, we believe another argument is simply that the Canada Health Act had five principles. It ensures, um, you know, portability, comprehensiveness of services, um, and public dollars go into those institutions. And if you are selectively deciding that you will only implement the ones you approve of, and that could also include include abortion, women's reproductive rights, various other procedures, then that's that's kind of an a la carte approach to the Health Act. And we don't think in the 21st century that's the way things should go. Um, if a hospital entirely in its own resources or a hospice or a care home that isn't accepting any public funding wants to go that route, that's their prerogative. But we think that the, where the public dollars are in place, um, that, that individuals should have access to their services. So I'm sorry I spoke for a bit of time there, um, but I hope that uh, gave you some sense of what some of the issues are and um, what you, you know, what, what we're dealing with. And I haven't even talked about the situation in Parliament at the moment. Maybe we can get into that. It's a very fraught environment right now. So um, uh, I'll stop there. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. And uh, um, let's see, can you stop your screen? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I will remove the spotlight right now. Uh, so we've come to the uh, uh, question and answers. If, uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. You will be first in line. Uh, I see Janet uh, has her thumbs up. <laughs> And uh, Joy will be the one who keeps track of uh, of how many seconds you have left. Um, I'm not going to spotlight the question uh, questioner, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I might uh, spotlight Chris. I'll see. Anyway, um, so keep it about two minutes long, not longer. Uh, Joy will, will cut you off, and we, we might even mute you, but I've never done that before, so I'm not that mean. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, I would uh, keep it respectful and uh, meaningful and constructive, please. And uh, there we go. Uh, so, J Janet. Uh, thank you. Um, about the five-year um, period, I'm concerned that, um, for example, I know somebody who developed Parkinson's at a very young age, and it progressed uh, extremely rapidly. Uh, and so that person would um, would not be eligible. So I want to know what you thought about that sort of situation. Well, um, so um, if, first of all, you would need to be 18 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, you would need to have a health card in a particular province. So you need to be eligible for health care in that province. But then aside from that, um, as long as you were, you could competently make a request for an advanced request in writing with the aid of maybe a notary or a lawyer, then, you know, as long as you are competent at the time you make it, that would be the only challenge. So if you're saying that person was no longer competent, then I don't, they, they, they must be able to request this voluntarily with full cognizance of what it entails. It's Sorry, okay. you're muted. You're muted, uh, Janet. Janet, you're muted. We couldn't hear what you were saying, Janet. 
Okay. Uh, it yeah, sounds it sounds like there would be an exception in that case. She she wasn't um close to 18, but she was probably 40, and that's unusual to be yes. um requiring nursing home, say at 42, a very rapid development. And uh, so as long as exceptions would be made in that sort of case, I you know, I yeah. Yeah, we, this is all theoretical at this point in time because we don't have an advanced request regime. And of mm -hmm. course, nobody can judge these matters aside. The only person eligible to talk about this would be that individual's clinician or nurse practitioner. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any more hands up. Uh, does anyone still have a question? I cannot imagine you wouldn't. Or it's been Chris. You've been so clear and 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 transparent that. Uh, uh, so Janet, you have another question. Is that true, or uh, you're still? I'm, I've un finally unmuted myself. Yes, um, a while ago, I'm in a writing group, and I. Oh, oh you're, you're muted, muted again. again. You're muted again. There we go. So I wrote a short story about three siblings coming to terms with uh, their father's requests were made. And I was a little leery. It was published in an anthology uh, by a writing group last fall. And I was just a little leery about somebody suing me. I'd love to send it to you, Chris, and see what you think. Um, that hopefully nobody would be up in arms by the story. I thought it could be very helpful to pe families that are dealing with it. But I'd, yeah. I'd love to be assured that I haven't written anything that's going to cause people to be lined up outside my house. It, is it fictional? Yes. Oh, then you're okay. I did mention. <laughs> uh, I did. I'm oh, sorry. I did mention something that was said in by the Ottawa appeared in the Ottawa Citizen, um, where they they had written about how certain hospitals were talking to patients, uh, suggesting, um, have you considered MAID? And, you know, obviously it was um, changed. Um, so um, anyway. Um, Can I just on that point, just jump in, because that has come up recently. And I want to just try to provide a little bit of background on that. So if a patient meets the clinical profile, in other words, they may be, they, these are just some of them, they may be advanced in age, they may have a terminal illness that is in its irreversible stage, they may be suffering intolerably. The a doctor in Canada has an obligation to make them aware of all of their medical options. So that is just a standard obligation that a doctor has. Only, you wouldn't make that um recommendation to a 25 year old who's perfectly you know reasonably healthy but has maybe one chronic it has to be a multiple multiplicity of conditions that would lead the clinician to say i am duty bound to let you know that in addition to palliative care in addition to pain relief in addition to some therapies you may wish to try made is also an option but it is only brought up in that particular context it's not brought up whimsically and i think that we've seen a lot of what what i think we found very frustrating and I, I hear this from the clinicians because of patient confidentiality and the strict requirement not to comment on the case of an individual where maybe a relative or some neighbor has made some comment to the media about how the made provision went down there is no way for the the physician to comment or rebut or say anything about that particular case. Confidentiality and privacy require that nothing be said. So there's been a, just so you guys are all aware, there's a whole lot of stuff that's been put out there in the last year that we know from our clinicians, not that they comment on individual cases to us, but they will say something like, the circumstances of that were far more complex than is being allowed in the media. And that's the problem, is that only one side of these stories is getting out there. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. I see there is another question. I hope, uh, Janet, you're uh, informed a bit better now. Yeah. 
Okay, so Janine, uh, you're the next. Hi there. I've got two questions. Um, the first is, um, I've heard that St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, which is a Catholic hospital, but I think is publicly funded, uh, um, possibly may not allow MAID. Um, and the other question is, if, uh, if someone has a, a properly documented MAID request, they've gone through everything, can a, uh, uh, um, a, a relative uh, interfere with MAID taking place? So on the first one, um, what we have in some hospitals, it's a concession that was made in recent years, was that what they are allowing those some of those denominational hospitals, and I think St. Paul, I think St. Paul's is one of them, or um, St. Michael's is one of them, is they allow an outsider to come in and do an assessment. So they won't allow the provision, but they will occasionally allow the assessment. So that's at least a step forward. But they certainly, very few of them would allow a provision under any circumstances. There's a technical way some may be tempted to get around it because they're coming under increasing pressure, particularly in BC, where St. Paul's has been in some hot water over this, is they're thinking of designating a room or a ward or some facility attached to the hospital as not part of the hospital in kind of legal terms, even if it's physically joined up and saying MAID could happen there. But generally, you're right. Um, these Many of these places at most will do an assessment, but some won't even do an assessment. Um, so that's that. Sorry, what was your second question again? Uh, the second question was, um, uh, if you have a properly um, done uh, MAID assessment, you're ready to go, whatever, can a, uh, a family member um, who, um, say for religious reasons, doesn't believe in it, can they interfere with that happening? So the answer to that is no. Um, the request, uh, when it's coming from a competent individual, uh, is solely a matter between that person and his or her clinician. And that's what's caused, you've seen some of these stories in the Fifth Estate and some of these other investigative shows where, where say, children or relatives complain about how the fact that their doctor didn't alert them to the fact that their loved one was about to pursue MAID. And the reason for that is that there are many cases in Canada and around the world where people have abusive relationships or there have been problems in their earlier life and they would be fearful that somebody else would countermand or negate that particular request. So the healthcare system is designed to ensure that it's only the patient and a his or her physician. And that no, as providing the person's over 18, no other family members are allowed to veto or pass judgment on them. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, I have a question. Uh, sure. I didn't put my hands on, but uh, nobody else is putting their hands off. Uh, before it was all uh, legislation, I know that um, there was another way of doing it, and that was uh, stopping eating and drinking. And then in eight days, uh, you were basically gone. And according to nurses and doctors, it was an eight on the scale of uh, from one to ten of a good death, if you can say that. Mm -hmm. um, is that still done, or do you know, or is it an individual thing that people just quietly do? Yes. Yeah. So you raised a fascinating topic, which is now the subject of some debate and discussion, which is, for the longest time prior to MAID, palliative care physicians made judgments, in, often in conjunction with relatives, of sick individuals about what should be the course of action. And quite often that consisted of over prescribing morphine or as you say, pulling away food and water, not hooking people up to different machines that might prolong life. And the maid, the, the maid doctors, the clinicians who agree to provide maid are often put on the hot seat for this decision that some others view as um, you know, unsavory and unpalatable. But, you know, the, the rejoinder would simply be that for many years, 
palliative care physicians have often made those very same decisions and choices in conjunction with a family member about what would happen. And that was that was always accepted and tacitly understood as an acceptable practice. It was just never mentioned. And I think what we're trying to say, I think what some of these clinicians are now saying is, look, every single made provision that happens in Ontario is referred to the coroner's office. So they are all reviewed, right? Unless, you know, and others on a selected basis and other provinces are. So there's a, a certain level of scrutiny that adheres to every made provision in, in most cases. That wasn't always the case in palliative care. Now, we, we think palliative care physicians do a wonderful job. They're providing really important life-affirming care and relief for people. So there's absolutely no criticism of it. But we just don't uh, believe that th just because somebody is bringing at that very end, when somebody has changed their mind and now wants relief and a dignified end, that somehow they, those physicians are doing something that is just, it's not compatible with traditional medicine. And I, I think a lot of people feel strongly that that's not the case, so. Okay, any other questions? So thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, if there are none, I still have another one. Sure. Oh. Okay, Margaret. Margaret first. I will be on cell. Okay, first, Margaret. Um, question, if a doctor on principle disagrees with MAID, is that, that doctor uh, um, obligated to refer to, a, to another clinician who would go ahead with the procedure? Yes, you're quite correct, Margaret. So it's known as the effective referral obligation. So any clinician it's provided for in the criminal code amendments. No clinician is obliged to perform MAID. And if they choose not to, they only have one obligation, and that is to provide a ref an effective referral to another physician who doesn't object. That's not to say that other physician will green light or rubber stamp the request for MAID, but at least they will engage in the assessment of that individual. So that is an obligation under our healthcare system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sal, I saw you had your hand up, but maybe you had the same kinds of questions. Okay, there we are. Uh, you're muted. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yes, I had written it in the chat, but um, oh, I I'll it. just read it out. Uh, to Chris, you mentioned disinformation in the media, especially within the last year. Yep. Hoping that you mean social media threads and not our professional Canadian news media. Could you clarify on that, please? Well, um, we, we would have seen distortions, misinformation, and embellishments in both sorts of media. So clearly, uh, in the Toronto Sun, for instance, we've seen some stuff that is... Uh, demonstrably problematic, but clearly there's even far more of that on social media threads where anything goes effectively. Is, by the way, my comments, I hope and trust, I'm making them uh, candidly and, conf and in the knowledge that we're a, a group here and that I should have said this at the outset. Um, I assume that anything I say stays within this group. These are, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm espousing the views of our organization. And I think they're transparent and clear, but I, I should, you know, I just wouldn't want anything I've said now to be. Um, um, we, we are planning to put it on YouTube, but the view is basically only our people of the CUC. Yes, that's so, fine. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. I just didn't, I just want to make sure that this was kind of a, um, a session amongst your members and not for other yes. people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I have one other question, and that is, um, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the legislation was quite uh, years and years ago that uh, uh, euthanasia was uh, was uh, uh, allowed in the law. Uh, what happened, unfortunately, that and I don't know if that is happening here too or not, uh, before uh, doctors would make a, a little uh, nudge of decision uh, 
in according to living wills and all that uh, kind of uh, precautions that they would uh, give a little bit more morphine or, or something like that and the person would uh, gently go uh, over the rainbow as it were uh, but then the legislation came through and suddenly uh, because of all the restrictions uh, people were dying before uh, it was approved that they would go through this uh, procedure. And that is all my question I have, John. <laughs> sure. So that's a really valid point, and it's a kind of paradoxical point. We we saw the other day when Health Canada released its 2022 annual report on the state of MAID in Canada that 2,900 people, I believe is the figure, um, died while waiting for MAID. So there are a large number of folks who, for various reasons to do with, um, uh, first of all, their geographic location, or if they are track two, in other words, death is not reasonably foreseeable. So, in a, you know, those ones tend, our clinicians spend a great deal more time examining, assessing the basis for it, determining whether it's legitimate or not. Those ones take longer, hence, um, and that's the way it should be. It's, it's due diligence being done. But the point is that exactly on your your point, Ellen, that that um, where that these um, hurdles that one must jump through are fairly rigorous and they will slow the process down. I think in one point I did want to bring up something that's related to that that I think is really powerful. One of the assertions of folks who believe that the mental disorders piece is completely inappropriate and no civilized society should be allowing folks with mental illnesses to have access to MAID. The irony is that uh, many people who are despairing for lack of either treatment and counseling um, are, are often driven to other actions, namely suicide, which is tragic and which we would always want to avoid. And we fully support anti-suicide measures. The, the paradox is that I believe that if somebody then comes to the hospital because they now know that MAID for a mental disorder is a lawful activity, they will then be forced to undergo an assessment. And what I actually believe, and I think some of our clinicians are picking that, making this point, it's not out there in the media yet, is that very active assessment may result in treatment, prescription of new medications, new therapies, new ways of attempting to handle the underlying uh, trauma and angst that that person is dealing with, which might actually in the long run reduce the incidence of suicide. So it's it's the fact that people will now be actually be getting, if they want this, they're going to have to have an assessment. At the moment, because it's illegal, they regrettably take matters into their own hands, or if they're rich enough, they go to Switzerland, where they can have a procedure done there. So I think that in some paradoxical ways, this might actually improve that situation. Oh, very interesting. Well, I think we have exhausted our Q&A session. And Chris, thank you so much for uh, giving us all this information. I think we become more enriched uh, away from this. And uh, thank everybody for coming. And uh, then I will share one more screen before we go. Uh, again, thank you for coming. Uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, resources. One is dyingwithdignity.ca, uh, the website for Dying with Dignity. Uh, then Canadian Unitary for Social Justice, of course, our own website that you have all gone through. Uh, and. Uh, um, that is another uh, source for a lot. Actually, the website becomes too big. I could use some help of somebody uh, plowing through it. I'm, I'm telling you. So if you if you want to contact me, that would be great. Uh, via uh, via CSJ Media at uh, at gmail dot com or President, uh, I, I will get that message too. Uh, so we have also a CSJ forum that is a discussion forum. Uh, people don't always uh, uh, agree with each other, but uh, that is all what discussion is about. Uh, and the remarks you can send to csjmedia at gmail.com. And we have a YouTube channel, and that is at 
CSJ Media, where you can find a lot of previous recordings of previous uh, sessions we had. And we have also a Facebook uh, group uh, that uh, could be maybe a bit more active, but it is actually, it, actually some action is uh, happening on there. So thank you so much, and uh, please uh, keep compassionate and stay safe. And we will see you again on uh, uh, in uh, the end of uh, November with Fulgens, uh, Reverend Fulgens, uh, and, a, and an announcement that will be on the CSJ.org again uh, that you can sign up for that uh, uh, probably next week. So thank you for coming and I will now end the session.